Okay, everyone, so let us uh, do the final Q&A for this retreat. And there is a suitable large number of questions, so we'll see what happens. Uh, <laughs> so the first here is a, uh, just a notice to everyone that um, tomorrow's morning meditation is at 6.30 a.m. So you know that, uh, so 6.30 tomorrow morning, yeah. Okay, so now let us go on to the, uh, the questions here. I'm not sure if there was a remaining question from yesterday, but anyway, we'll get maybe part of this uh, pile, so let's see where we get. Uh, dear Ajahn, please explain four slash eight jhanas. When someone gets the fourth jhana, uh, means a stream master. Pretty as tranquility, sukha, and one point it means first jhana. Um, I would be grateful if you could give a summary uh, of this with Metta. Um, okay, so the jhanas are uh, stages of uh, a stillness or peace, and they don't necessarily imply stream entry. Uh, uh, very often what will happen is that as you go through the jhanas, you will attain stream entry at some point, because the profundity of the state is such that it will allow this to happen fairly easily. Yeah, they are close, there's a lot of insight that comes with them. Uh, and so the chances are, when you come to the second or third jhana or their advance, uh, chances are fairly good if you're a Buddhist uh, and you have right view, that you actually will become a stream enter. Uh, but uh, it's not a given, and it's possible to go all the way to the fourth jhana and beyond, even without attaining stream entry. Uh, but normally it would happen fairly early on because of the power of those uh, states. So, um, uh, so it's kind of uncertain, yeah? there's no kind of direct relationship between the jhanas and stream entry. It depends on the person, all of these kind of things. Uh, and yes, the five, facult five factors of the first jhana is said to be piti, uh, uh, sukha, uh, vitaka, vichara, and ekagata. Are con considered the five fa factors of the first jhana. It's found in, uh, I think, only one sutta in the Tipitaka. Uh, and that is in the, uh, I think, the um, either Chula or Maha Vedala Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya 43 or 44, one of those. Uh, um, and uh, so these are indicators uh, of whether you have attained the jhana or not. Yeah, have you got the piti, the happiness, the joy, uh, the sukha, uh, vitaka vichara in the, the case of the first jhana. Vitaka uh, usually means thinking, yeah? but uh, in the first jhana it is the most refined thinking that is possible. Uh, in the second jhana all vitaka vichara is gone. Uh, so it is the last remnant of uh, thinking. What is that? Well, it's just a very marginal movement of the mind. That's really what it is. Uh, that's how it's explained in the places like the Visuddhi Magga. And it kind of makes sense because it is the final remnant before it disappears altogether. Uh, as Vitaka Vichara. Um, can be translated in different ways. Um, uh, uh, sometimes translated as thought and exam examination, but it's not very precise. Uh, uh, sometimes translated as kind of placing the mind and keeping it connected is kind of one contemporary translation by Anta Sujato, which I think is closer to the actual meaning in this context. Uh, um, so again, the idea here is that these words have different meanings depending on context, uh, and they have a very specific meaning in the first jhana. It's a particular strength of piti, a particular strength of sukha. It's not just ordinary piti sukha, it's kind of way up there uh, as first jhana. But uh, in general, these are considered the uh, factors. Uh. So, um, can you explain the fourth to the eighth jhanas? Uh, um, so, the, the, these are states where the mind is completely one-pointed, uh, yeah, where there is no, uh, from the second jhana onwards, there's no movement at all. Uh. This is why it's called ekatta. Ekatta means one-pointedness, or it means unity, really. The mind is unified. Uh. There's no distinction between observer and the observed. Uh, usually in life we have a feeling that we are here and we are observing things outside. Uh, and the same is true in meditation practice. Yeah, you have like an um, image in meditation and then you have the observer. Uh, but there comes a point when the observer and the observer becomes one uh, and there's kind of complete unity. Uh, there's no feeling of separation anymore. Uh, and that's why these things are sometimes interpreted in certain religions as God, because you're one kind of with the universe at that particular point. And then as you go deeper in the jhanas, that one-pointedness, that unity, uh, 
remains, but you abandon certain of the qualities of the mind. You abandon the piti, you uh, abandon the sukha. In the fourth jhana, all there is is equanimity, a pure equanimity. And pure equanimity, and this is weird, is more pleasurable than, than happiness. That's weird, isn't it? This is kind of how this path works. So you get to equanimity, and then you go beyond that, you go into the what is called the immaterial attainments. They're not really called the four jhanas, or the uh, jhanas anymore, they're called immaterial attainments. Uh, and that gets even more weird when you go into these states. So that's a rough guide to the, uh, to the jhanas. I hope that is helpful. Uh, so let's go on to the next question. Uh, Dear Ajahn, after listening to the last night's Q&A, it seems many people experience strong positive reactions to the guided death meditation. I also experienced tear of joy and thrilling bright mind. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's wonderful, isn't it? Uh, I'm always... It's kind of really nice. Okay, so is it usual for meditators or common uh, to experience these consequences to a guided death med- contemplation? And should we incorporate more of these imaginary meditations into our practice? Uh, thank you, and Sadhu times 33. <laughs> <laughs> so what is 33? Mm, okay. I, mm. <laughs> so that's wonderful, and this is kind of the idea, because the idea is that you it helps you to give up. Yeah? That's kind of the whole purpose of death meditation. If you experience joy, it means that you are giving up a lot of the world. That's where the joy comes from, from the ability to give up. And yes, it is quite common to have a good experience with that kind of contemplation, but make it your own, right? And try it out for yourself and see if you can make it work. And it's a kind of contemplation that... Uh, if you do the same thing every time, it gets a bit tired after a while. It's as if the effect wears off a little bit. But if you, uh, but you can try yeah, and see how you can make it work in your in your own life. So you can do it. Uh, maybe not every time you sit down, or you can try to do it every time if you like. Yeah, see if it works, uh, and uh, see what happens. Uh, be a bit creative with these kind of uh, meditations because if you're not creative, they uh, dry out after a while. They don't work so so well after a while. So be creative. Uh, think of new ways of doing this. Uh, yeah, imagine uh, imagine kind of various scenarios on how you might die. One of the things the Buddha says in the Sutta is you should reflect on the various ways you can die because that makes it more real, right? Uh, uh, having cancer in your body. I always think that I have cancer somewhere because my father died of cancer, my sister died of cancer. So probably I also have cancer somewhere, right? It kind of goes in the family, it's probably genetic, yeah. So I think chances of me dying of cancer, pretty high here. Yeah. When? I don't know. Hopefully not while I'm giving this Q&A session. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what happens. That would be a good lesson, wouldn't it? Uh, the tall, speedy guys. <laughs> that would be real death contemplation for you. Yeah. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, he tells a story when he was giving a talk at the Maloka Center in Perth. I don't know if you heard about that. It's quite an amazing story. This man came up to him and asked him some questions. And then while he was asking questions, he said, oh, I'm feeling a bit funny now. And he fell over and died. Yeah, it's like kind of amazing. Ajahn Brahm said, I'm not sure whether Ajahn was with him. Ajahn probably, oh yeah, okay, get some, get some help. <laughs> I don't know what he said. Because Ajahn Brahm is pretty cool about dying here. And uh, that's kind of extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'll try not to replicate that tonight. Too. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm very happy to hear that. So please just, uh, please just try it out and see what happens in your practice. Okay. To Ajahn Brahmali. Is that Ajahn Brahm or Ajahn Brahmali? I'm not sure. I think it's me. Okay. Thank you for your... Uh, wonder, not sure. Okay, so, oh, this is just a thank you note. This is very nice. Uh, thank you for your wonderful and wise talks uh, to the venerable, uh, the venerable Chanta, venerable Upeka. You are an inspiration to us all. Please continue on the wonderful path of the Dharma. Yay! Yes. <laughs> to the retreat manager, this is um, Shell. You are amazing. Yeah. Well, this is nice, isn't it? There's one one nice thing after the other. Wow, this is really this is good. Uh, to my fellow participants, yeah, even the snorers. Wow, this is compassion in action. Yeah. <laughs> really, that's powerful stuff. Okay, thank you. You all have been so wonderful, loving, caring, patient. It fills my heart so much. Uh, great. So I, I don't know. This is kind of the sort of note we should keep. Maybe keep to one side when we're done. You can kind of 
keep that to remind you of the wonderful services that uh, you are providing and everyone is providing it. I'll keep it to one side for now. We'll, we'll see what we do with these beautiful words. Uh, you know the story of Ajahn Brahm? He says that in the uh, early days, whenever he got a nice thank you letter or whatever, he would put it away in a special cabinet made for thank you letters. Uh, and whenever anything got a bit tough in the monastery or difficult, uh, he would take it out and read the thank you letters. Uh, that's pretty smart, isn't it? Uh, so these things we should uh, look after as special gifts. Uh, okay, put it over here. So, uh, okay. By the way, we do take complaints seriously as well. We don't handle them <laughs> just, to, just so that you are aware of that. So if there are issues, we, uh, we don't overlook that. Uh, um, okay, can you read Samadhi through listening to the Dhamma? Um, you can uh, start the process of Samadhi by listening to the Dhamma, and this is from the Suttas. Uh, so as you listen to the Dhamma, uh, your mind becomes peaceful, you become inspired, right? Uh, this is what we were looking at before. You uh, Reflecting on the Dhamma is one thing, uh, but even just listening to a Sutta, reading a Sutta, uh, or reflecting on it afterwards, uh, uh, all of that can actually bring inspiration there. And then once the inspiration arises, uh, you don't want to listen so much anymore, because that will kind of destroy the samadhi. So once the inspiration arises, uh, then you kind of go to one side and you carry on the meditation. Or you carry on after the Dhamma talk, right? The Dhamma talk gives rise to, to the right kind of feelings, uh, and then it carries on afterwards. Uh. So you, don't, you cannot go into samadhi while listening, because that's, you know, the mind is way too peaceful for that to be possible, but you can start the process of samadhi, get it going, and that's what's important. There is a sutta in the Guttur Nikaya called the five or six vimuttayatanas, the spheres of liberation, and they are based on precisely this idea. And listening to the Dhamma, you can kind of move towards samadhi, teaching Dhamma, you can move towards samadhi, contemplating the Dhamma, you can move towards samadhi, samadhi you have all of these things. And uh, even teaching, right? Uh, you can imagine, because you get so inspired sometimes when you teach the Dhamma. Uh, you can see, uh, it's interesting to see someone like Ajahn Brahm teach the Dhamma. Uh, and sometimes he kind of starts almost crying while he's teaching the Dhamma. Uh, and he has to stop. And he has to, and he tells the audience, actually, now I have to stop because otherwise, uh, if, I, if I go any further now, I'm just going to disappear into Samadhi. There will be no more talk after this. Uh, so kind of, he, it's really powerful things, yeah, because you, you just deliver these teachings. And with someone like Ajahn Brahm, is very impromptu. And sometimes it kind of gets into this track of very inspiring teachings. Uh, it's kind of remarkable to see these things happening in front of your eyes. Uh, and uh, the, of course, the feeling in the room is also very powerful when someone like that teaches. Uh, you feel kind of the peace in the room, uh, and it kind of penetrates into you. Uh, it's like, you know, receiving the Dhamma transmission through osmosis, it just kind of goes into you and you kind of feel the peace. It's very, uh, very, very tangible. Huh? So the answer to the question is yes, uh, basically. Huh? Dear Ajahn, thank you for your wonderful teachings. I have often wondered uh, whether anything exists outside of our minds. Is everything our imagination? Did the Buddha address this? Sometimes we... Um, well, this is kind of one of those classic uh, philosophical questions. Uh, what is the world? Is the world, is it kind of physical matter, or is it all mind-made, ultimately? Yeah. And uh, it's a philosophical question, not really a scientific question, uh, because science doesn't really settle these kind of things. Uh, uh, science is just measurements of the world, and how we interpret those measurements will really depend on your philosophy. Yeah. And there are many philosophers these days who say that all of science is compatible with mind-only world, so it's not anti-scientific to have that idea. But Buddhism is kind of not really very clear on that. The clearest you come is a little sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 4, it's called the Rohitasa Sutta, uh, where the Buddha says something to the effect that uh, the world exists in this fathom-long body with its mind. It's almost as if saying that, right? Uh, all very close to saying that uh, it is a mental universe, this fathom long body, in other words, your world, that's the world. Uh, this is my world right now, this is my mind, this is my body, uh, this is what I experience. Uh, is there any, does it make sense to talk about the world outside of my experience, outside of your experience? We all have our own little world. Uh, and uh, it's a good question. Uh, but, but the world that matters from a Buddhist point of view is your personal world. Uh, 
because that is where there is dukkha. Yeah, that is where there is the origination of dukkha from craving. That's where it all stops. That's where the path happens. That is the only world that really matters. If there is something out there, it's probably quite irrelevant to us. It doesn't really matter. This, yeah. So uh, there isn't really any final answer to this, and I think it's uh, uh, sometimes it's not too useful to get too philosophical because uh, philosophy has no end, and that's the problem. Uh, it doesn't actually, you know, people have been arguing about this for thousands of years, they have found no solution. Uh, the Buddha said, you know, the famous simile of the leaves in the Gusinga grove, these are what I have taught, uh, these leaves, uh, and uh, all the leaves overhead in the trees, but that's kind of all the things I know about that I haven't taught you. Why have that taught you those things? Because it's actually irrelevant to the spiritual path. Uh, and that might be, you know, things, truths about the world, uh, yeah, that actually have nothing to do with the spiritual practice. Like, for example, this sort of question there. Okay. Devante, uh, would attempting to go for extinguishment involve Vibhava Tanha? Uh, many thanks, Devante, for Envenable Chun, Chanda, uh, all the organizers, and Shell for an amazing retreat. Uh, Great. Um, so, uh, uh, it, it, does it involve Vibhavatana? And uh, the, uh, one of the interesting things in the suttas is that uh, Vibhavatana is said to be close to the Buddhist ideas. Uh, yeah? Vibhava means extinct, non-existence. Tanna is craving. The craving for non-existence is what it, this refers to. Uh, and uh, the Buddha says <coughs> specifically that the idea of annihilation uh, yeah, if you have that idea, you're not so far away from Buddhism. Right? You're not quite there because nothing gets annihilated. You haven't really understood the problem right? because of all that you're doing when you practice the path, you are extinguishing suffering. Yeah? So isn't that a good thing, extinguishing suffering? Yeah? It's good, right? Yeah, you agree? Okay, good. <laughs> so extinguishing suffering is good. So how can that be a problem? Well, the only reason it's a problem is because we think we are annihilating something. Yeah? And that something is what our sense of self. Yeah? But uh, if that self is, if that is an illusion, then all that remains is dukkha, and so you're extinguishing dukkha. So vibhavatana is a false view. Huh? There is no, uh, you're not destroying anything, you're not annihilating anything. Yeah? Or all you're doing is ending dukkha, which is good news. If you don't think it's good news, then uh, I don't know what to say to you. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> dear Ajahn, do you have any advice for someone who is a people pleaser? Huh? and finds it difficult to say, no, thank you for sharing the Dhamma. I think everyone is a little bit of a people pleaser. Yeah? I, I also find it very hard to say no, usually, yeah? even though I have had to start to say no, because the too many things happening, you just have to say no, otherwise you're going to die. You have a choice between saying no and dying, so then, okay, <laughs> I'll say no. Yeah? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yes, the, uh, remember that uh, uh, people pleasing doesn't, it's not really all that useful. Usually the reason why people, we please people is because we want to be seen in a good way and we want to kind of, uh, you know, not let people down and all these kind of things. Uh, but uh, in the longer run, it's more important that you look after yourself and you find the right balance in your life. Uh, because in the long run, your ability to actually please people in a deep way, with real Compassion, real understanding, real a good attitude, uh, that depends on you being in balance. Uh. So much better to be able to give, provide real profound services uh, rather than provide some superficial service uh, because your mind is not in a good state. Uh. So look after yourself, yeah? make sure you do that and say, I'm terribly sorry, but uh, I, I just, just too much for me. My life is too full. Uh, I need to look after myself. One of the most important things we can do in the world is to look after ourselves. Uh. The Buddha spent six years just going into the forest, doing no service for anyone, apparently, but actually that was the biggest service in human history. Because when he went off on his own, seemingly, um, you know, in a selfish way, or maybe selfish is the wrong word, but uh, seemingly in a kind of without providing services, uh, he actually opened the door for the greatest service that anyone has ever provided for humanity. Without that, nothing would have happened. So sometimes the truth is much more complicated than we think. Yeah? So uh, uh, say no, because uh, that in the long run is actually a yes, if you know what I mean. Uh, 
Yeah? Because the yes here means the service, it means helping other people. So no to short-term service, but long, yes to the long-term service. And that is the one that really matters. And if other people don't like you for that, it's not your problem, it's their problem now. Okay. Dear Bhante, I, in today's sutta, as Bhante mentioned, three ways to tackle thoughts, uh, where they're overcome by unwholesome thoughts, by following, or where they overcome unwholesome thoughts by following the five precepts. Uh, did Bhante say also let go of wholesome thoughts? Please clarify as I misunderstood uh, and go into samadhi. Uh, um, okay, so. Um, Overcome unwholesome, th- yeah, so the first part here precisely is to overcome unwholesome thoughts. Uh, that is the beginning. Uh, keeping the five precepts is not enough. Uh, that's just the beginning point. Uh, what I was saying is that there is different levels of unwholesome thoughts. Uh, the coarsest kind of unwholesome thoughts <coughs> you overcome by keeping the five precepts. The next level of unwholesome thoughts, uh, which is not as coarse and bad, <coughs> You overcome by right effort, yeah, by thinking, by using wisdom. That was one of the, some of the things I was talking about today. How to look at other people in a new way, how to change your perspective on the world, and develop your perceptions. All of that is then about overcoming the middling bad thoughts. And then there are even more refined thoughts, yeah, that you, uh, where we kind of overcome the sensory world and all of these kind of things. So gradually, gradually, gradually overcoming the unwholesome thoughts by stages. Start with the coarse, then the middle, and then the refined. The the really refined, unwholesome thoughts are thoughts about yourself, yeah, your your reputation, your country, and and those kind of things. Uh, That has to do with our identity. That is kind of gets very refined. Uh, And then, quite right, then you overcome the wholesome thoughts, uh, yeah, the kind of the metta, the karuna, those kind of things, and that allows you access to samadhi. That's quite right, what you're saying there, yeah. What is the difference between Sampajanya and Yonisomanasikara, please? Uh, so, uh, these terms are very closely related to each other. Yonisomanasikara is defined in the suttas uh, as whenever you attend, yeah, Yoniso is like wise, Manasikara is attention, wise attention. You have wise attention every time, whenever your wholesome qualities go up, your unwholesome qualities go down. Uh, you have unwise attention when the unwholesome qualities go up and the wholesome qualities go down. This is the definition found in the Sabhasava Sutta, Majjhimanika number two. You can read, read it right there. So that is the idea of Yonisamanasikara. So for that reason, it starts at the very beginning of the path and goes all the way to the very end when you become an Arahant. Yeah, when you start out, you become a Buddha, you think, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should follow this Buddha. It seems like a you know, interesting person, maybe I should do that. Yeah, that's first Yonasamanasikara. Yeah, it begins with that. Uh, and then it ends with, bang, the insight. You become an arahant. You see kind of the four noble truth, finally once and for all, you make an end of rebirth. Uh, that's the final Yonasamanasikara. Everything in between, uh, as long as you're moving in the right direction, is all Yonasamanasikara. You take one step back, that's at Yonasamanasikara. Uh, so Yonasamanasikara is very broad. It's one of the foundations of the path. Uh, Sampajanya is usually, uh, it's very similar, yeah, because it's kind of a wise understanding of things, uh, but it's kind of specified at the time of sense restraint, usually around that time. Uh, and it is this kind of sense restraint uh, that uh, we discussed this before the idea of purpose and suitability of what you are doing. That is what Sampajanya is about. Uh, so, what is the purpose of doing something? Uh, if you're going to the casino, is that a good idea? Yeah, that's the kind of question. Okay, why am I going to the casino? Is it to develop Dhamma qualities or is it not? Or is it maybe some other reason for going to the casino? Yeah, or all of these things that we do in life, is it really going to be helpful for the Dhamma or is it not going to be? Okay, now I'm eating. I'm eating too much, but actually I want to eat still more. So eat a little bit more than oh, too much. Right? That is kind of anti Dhamma because you won't be able to meditate afterwards, it's going to have negative effects. 
or kind of sitting up late at night doing kind of silly things or whatever, yeah, it kind of makes you tired in the morning when maybe ideally you should do some metta meditation lasting at night or whatever. You ask yourself, what is the purpose? Why am I doing these things? This is Sankarajanya. Am I doing it? Is this going to lead to good qualities or is it going to lead to bad qualities? How can I kind of make the path work for me here? In everything that you do now. But it doesn't really matter so much how we, you know, these words are just words and what matters is that we are progressing on the path. What does emptiness or sunyata exactly mean in Buddhism? Emptiness means emptiness of a self. Yeah? There is no essence in a human being here. That's what emptiness means in the suttas. Yeah? You look inside, you don't find any final you. It's just kind of like an onion. You peel off layer after layer. It's like a plantain tree, a banana tree here. Apparently banana trees, when you peel off the leaves, yeah, one day, you come to the center, there's nothing there. It's empty inside. We are a bit like that. Yeah? We're like plantain trees. <laughs> I don't know if you feel like a plant entry, but anyway, that's there you are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> would Bhante consider translating yeah, or rewriting some of the important suttas so they can be easily read and understood directly without having to guess what the Buddha was referring to? Um, I think regardless of how you translate it, you're going to need someone to talk about them yeah, and discuss them. And after a while you start to understand them yourself because you have such a you have had good guidance, yeah, you come on a few retreats like this, you listen to some good guidance on the internet, uh, YouTube or whatever, and after a while it becomes clear to you what is going on. Uh, there isn't really possible to translate it in a way whereby you understand everything, because uh, unless you write endless amounts of footnotes and introductions and everything, and this is what Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi does to some extent, uh, <coughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, I, I don't think that is the answer. The answer is more to learn to read the suttas, uh, go on retreats, uh, listen to explanations, uh, find a few good people who explain these teachings well. Don't listen to too many teachers. You get very, very confused after a while if you do that. Uh, yeah, after, I mean, I'm not saying that you should just choose one, that should be a guru, especially in the beginning, listen to a few different ones. But once you kind of hone in on a few people you trust, uh, stay with them. Uh, too many Dhamma talks is also bad. Uh, <laughs> there was a nice, I don't know, there's a, a suttacentral.net, yeah, is the place where all the suttas are found on the internet. This is Bhante Sujato's kind of a baby, he has been you know, making his baby grow over the years, becoming bigger and bigger, this baby. Yeah. And um, attached to Sutta Central, there is this other website called, uh, uh, called uh, what's it called again now, D Discover and Discuss or Discuss and Discover or something like that. Uh, and uh, there is all this kind of essays about Dhamma, yeah, and about various suttas, and people argue about suttas. Actually, it's very civilized, I have to say. Uh, for the internet, this is a really civilized kind of place. Uh, so if you want to discuss some Dhamma in a civilized place, it's not a bad place to go. But one of the essays that uh, uh, Bhattu Sujata wrote uh, was an essay was titled Use Are Listening to Too Many Dhamma Talks. Uh, that was the title of the essay, right? Use, that's kind of the... Uh, this is what they say, some, some people say here in North of England, I think, as well, right? And also some parts of Australia, the plural of you. So, they, <laughs> and it's true, and sometimes what happens is that people play Dhamma talks like all the time, like in the background, without really listening properly, really, without really taking on board what is being said. And it becomes like a white noise almost in the background. <laughs> And the idea is, if you listen to a lot of dialogues, somehow it will kind of penetrate into you, right, if you listen to a lot. Uh, but actually, it is not the right way of doing it. Uh, if you look at the suttas, how the Buddha says you should listen, you should listen with full attention, uh, as if it is a vital concern, uh, as if it's incredibly important, right? Uh, that is how you should listen to Dhamma talks. If it is just noise in the background, you're really wasting your time. You're not listening properly. So you are probably, probably most people listen to too many Dhamma talks, right? Turn them off. Use them only to encourage yourself when you read a little bit of inspiration. Yeah? Listen to Dhamma talk a few times a week, two times a week, once a week, yeah? something like that. Not all the time, because it is actually going to be counterproductive. So be wise about that. Use are listening to too many Dhamma talks. I love that title. I think it's a wow, it's a really, really good title. Good on you, Bhattasujato. <laughs> so um, 
Anyway, so that's mm, that's what I say anyway. But I might be completely off track, so you can take it uh, take it or leave it as you wish. Uh, <coughs> all right. Uh, in today's sutta, but uh, referred to the importance of jhanas one to four. Are the jhanas one to eight not so important in the path and not needed? Uh, they are not part of the Noble Eightfold Path, so they are not actually needed. That's quite correct. If you get to the fourth jhana, you have everything you need to become an Arat. Uh, also, could Bhante please explain how the four jhanas link in with the Anapanasati Sutta? At what stage and the interpretation of this jhanas uh, alongside Anapanasati? I did actually mention that while I was giving the talk, yeah, so... Uh, okay, but I'll just mention it again. So... Uh, um, the, uh, what I said was that in the sta- the 16 stages, right, Anapanasati, stage number 12, it says Vimochayang Chittang. Vimochayang means liberating the mind. It's the last thing you do. When you liberate the mind, what happens? You enter jhana. So the, 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 these steps, 12 steps, they lead up to jhana, and they actually give you access to the jhanas, and that's kind of where that sutta ends and the Mojang Chittan can mean many things. It can mean the first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, or fourth jhana, depending on the momentum uh, by which you enter the jhana. If the me- momentum is very high, yeah, you go all the way to the fourth jhana. One, two, three, four, bang, yeah. And you go into that. Uh, that's where you find it. Uh, and then you have the uh, kind of more insight practices afterwards, anicca, viraga, and niroda, and patanissa afterwards. Uh. <laughs> All right, that was a long question, so, uh, okay, good, let's go on to the next one. Uh, Dear Raja, the sutta discussed this morning covered two kinds of thoughts. Uh, During my practice, I find myself applying more than two categories of labels. For example, chatter, irrelevant, unhelpful thinking. Uh, Is that okay? Um, Yes, it is okay. Uh, but I think the, and, and it's good that you do that, it means that you have some insight into what is going on. Uh, but try to kind of understand why you have these thoughts. Labeling them is one thing, uh, but really understanding why they are arising is sometimes even more useful. Uh, so, uh, you know, and the reason why they tend to arise is because the mind is bored. That is one, one possibility. It wants to just chatter away and also talk about all kinds of things. Uh, so to reduce the boredom, you have to have more interest in the object. Uh, that is one reason. The other reason, as I've been saying throughout, is that this interest in that world, uh, and that drives the chapter. So by reducing the interest in that world, uh, that's the other way of doing it. Uh, so labeling it can be useful, but try to go a little bit deeper as well, if you can. Uh, question number two. Uh, could you confirm that the precepts on abstaining from false speech includes refraining from idle chatter, divisive chatter, and hard speech. Uh, not really. Uh, uh, the, the precept on uh, false speech is only false speech. Uh, and then there's a tendency in the Buddhist world to include the other kinds of wrong speech into that. But actually the precept itself is only false speech. Musavada literally means lying speech. Uh, so it cannot include these other things. Uh, but if you talk about Samma, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Samma Kamata, Samma Vajra, the uh, third factor of the uh, uh, the third of the eightfold path. Uh, yeah, Samma Vajra, right speech. There you do find these these four. So these are part of wrong speech, but they're not included in the five precepts. So you should be doing it, but they're not technically part of the five precepts. But don't be satisfied with the five precepts. If you are satisfied with the five precepts, it is not enough to go a long way on this path. Uh, five precepts is the bare minimum, uh, yeah, it's the absolute minimum. Uh, and if you're not keeping the five precepts yet, then come tomorrow and I will give them to you. I will force them onto you if you're not taking them already. <laughs> but, no, I'm just, whatever. It's, I'm tied up to you, of course. But I'm just saying that morality is so foundational on this path, right? Uh, that if you don't take this really, really seriously, uh, you're not going to go very far in your meditation. It's absolutely fundamental for how this path works. Uh, so eliminate all kinds of bad speech. Uh, do be as kind as you possibly can in your speech, in your actions, in your thoughts. Then it's going to uh, start to really bite your, your kind of morality that you're practicing. Yeah? 
So whether it is part of the five precepts or not, actually, as far as practice is concerned, probably doesn't matter so much. Uh, thank you so much. This retreat uh, and your teaching have come to me at the perfect timing and uh, solidify my faith in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Sadhu times ten. <laughs> okay, we have various numbers here. So I don't know, but that's cool. So uh, excellent. Uh, very happy to hear that. Uh, so good. So I said I was going to answer every question. So we'll see how things go. I should be able to do that. Uh, oh, okay. So hopefully this is not going to take too, <laughs> too long. Yeah. But uh, dear Randa, not a question. Ah, okay, good. But some comments and a request. I feel that the attempt by some modern scholars to compare suttas in different schools and languages uh, and to come to conclusions is a bit like blind men trying to describe an elephant uh, as in that famous sutta. And a number of things could have happened that caused teachings preserved in different schools to differ. Uh, uh, bloody wars and even malicious hacking over centuries could be among some of them. Uh, it would be good to have a new type of Buddhist council where a group of at least five monks with psychic powers visit the Tavatinsa realm uh, and uh, ask the uh, boss Saka, <laughs> this is the head there, uh, he should be able to guide them on the right uh, to the right Eva as we listen to some of the teachings directly from the Buddha, then the problem of not believing will not be there as, uh, as uh, the witnessing of them, uh, uh, something like that. Uh, so, uh, oh, Bhante, please ask those venerables to inquire from the devas whether Abhidhamma was preached to them too. <laughs> that would be very useful to know. I know this might sound silly and crazy, but please try and plant this idea in the minds of some monk with psychic powers. This would be for the better than dubious academic scholarship. Please forgive me for saying so, Bhante. Um, I may, I'm not sure if I will forgive this. This is, whoa, this is really controversial. I, you, you will be surprised, I think, how, how good some of this academic research is. This is done by some of the most very, very well-practiced monks in the world who actually do this kind of academic research. And the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, who is one of these people, he approves of this research, he does it himself. Someone like Ajahn Brahm is certainly not against this kind of research. The point to remember is that uh, if you read the suttas as we have them in Theravada Buddhism, uh, it's just one school. Uh, other schools handed down the, the suttas as well. Uh, so when you compare the suttas, uh, you're moving towards the common ancestors of those various schools. Uh, so it actually is a very, very powerful technique. Uh, and the, but the most important finding, and then I think maybe this is where perhaps you misunderstand a little bit, uh, the most important finding when, what we have when we do this comparison is the, is the incredible overlap between the suttas, yeah? How similar they are. They have been apart for 2,200, 2,300 years. Uh, this goes back to the time of Ashoka when this school spread around over India and he deliberately spread Buddhism around. Uh, that is when the various schools were often established. The Sarvastivadans were in the north of India, in Kashmir, in that area. The Dhammaguptaka were in the Gandharan area, a bit further west. Uh, and you had the uh, Mahasangikas were more in central India, the Theravadans in the south, in Sri Lanka, etc. But despite the fact that these schools have been separated for 2,300 years, uh, when you read the suttas, they are still very, very, very close. Uh, so there's no doubt that we have the word of the Buddha, uh, right? You don't need anything more than that. Uh, sometimes they can elucidate little things uh, and they can kind of clarify certain things. Uh, and that can be very helpful. And I think the scholarship is actually very good. I think it is much more reliable, personally, than going to Tabatings to heaven and asking some kind of monk with psychic powers. I think that idea is completely nuts, to be honest with you. Because, <laughs> because you, you don't know, you know if this monk actually has real psychic power or is he just crazy? You don't know when he goes to heaven, who does he actually meet in this heavenly realm? You don't know if this deva remembers correctly. It's just fraud with problems, right? <laughs> And uh, so I, I think, I, I don't want to be rude, but I, I don't think it is a very good idea, if I may put it that way. I think it's, it's kind of, uh, I think modern scholarship is far, far superior to this, this idea. It sounds good in theory. I've heard many people suggest this in the past, but the more I think about it, the worse I think that idea actually is. 
I, I apologize for being so harsh on that, that idea. But, uh, <laughs> okay, anyway, let's move on to the next one here. Aja, I find it challenging to hear an almost dismissal about taking action on climate change, inequality, war, animals and human rights from Buddhist perspective. Uh, this is a passive stance which is not non-violent. Non-violence is not being passive. Uh, since the world spoke of non-violence, is it not our duty as Buddhists to take non-violent action? Uh, or should we be passive and stand by and watch billions of people and non-humans, animals, the ecosystem suffer? Given the Western world, uh, Global North, we have our lifestyles uh, changed drastically to the uh, a dependence on oil and animal agriculture never seen in history, which causes uh, mass suffering. I would argue that the Buddha, if they uh, were here at this time, would be at the forefront of nonviolent direct action and advocating more greatly for change and compassion than many, especially Theravadan monks, do. Her. Your thoughts with compassion for all living beings, seen and unseen, Sadhu times three. Yes, I, I agree with you. I, I don't, what I, it is not meant as a dismissal, the thing that I say, and that this is, would be the wrong way of understanding it. Uh, I think it's good to do actions on climate change and inequality and all of these kind of things, uh, and we should do it with a heart of compassion, trying to make the world a better place. I think that's wonderful, and I think that is part of morality, yeah, that we do these kind of things. Uh, I certainly don't dismiss that. Uh, so please do so, and I wish more people would do it, and I wish we could get our act together, and I wish that the world would avoid these things. But the problem, the problem really is this. The problem is that we don't know if it can be done, right? And it's kind of interesting when you look at the world of the last few decades, you get, after a while, you start to wonder whether we are up to this yeah, as human beings. Are our politicians, are they wise enough to understand the problem? Yeah, are we, even if we take all the action we can, is it going to work out? And this is the problem. You look at the history of the world, you would have thought that after the Second World War, we would never have a war again. And now we have a war in Ukraine. Why is that? Because we forget. Because we are fickle. Yeah, we don't really kind of stay with our principles well enough. And this is kind of the idea of Buddhism. The idea of Buddhism is that... Uh, Yes, we do our very best to create the best possible world, more equality, less social inequality, uh, you know, looking after the poor people, looking after people who have addictions and all of this kind of thing. All of these things are very, very important. Uh, but the problem is that the problems seem to recur. They come back again, again and again and again. Uh, and there is no final solution to these things. And that is the problem. Uh, there is no utopia. This is what I was saying before, and when there is no utopia, it means that things tend to go in waves, coming back and coming back, and then recurring, and then disappearing again. And this is the problem of the world. So when you see climate change, do your best, but don't assume that it will be successful. Because if you assume it will be successful, then you're going to be very depressed when it isn't successful. But if you accept that even if you do your best, actually success may not happen, then you can deal with the failure if it happens, uh, and you can move on, and you can actually look for some, a solution somewhere else, look for a solution within, in your heart, uh, instead. Uh, that is where the real solution lies at the end of the day, uh, because the world will never be as good as we think it should be. Uh, that is just the nature of this world. Uh, even if you get reborn in the heavenly realm, for goodness sake, even the devas have wars. Uh, yeah, and finally you think, oh, I'm going to get out of the heavenly realm, like, no, human realm, they're going to go to heaven, finally they can relax a little bit, but then it turns out heaven isn't that much better than the human realm. Huh? It's a little bit better, true, huh? depends how high you go, if you go really high, you, it's quite good. Huh? And uh, so this is the um, issue with this samsaric existence. Uh, there isn't really an escape by making the world better. You do, the, you do however, do it, because it is the morally right thing to do. Huh? Yeah, so for that reason you do it, uh, but you also understand the limitations of your actions. Uh, I don't know, I mean, you, when you look at our ability to sort out climate change, it's a bit depressing, isn't it? Uh, I mean, it's not that I get depressed very easily, but you know, it is a bit like, you, you feel like giving up on people a little bit when you see that we have been warned about this for decades uh, and still nothing is happening. Uh, 
Sometimes it seems like we need a crisis before we get our act together. That seems to be how humans work. Only when we get a real crisis do we actually do something. So, uh, anyway, I don't disagree with you. I think you're right about what you're saying. But I think there is a deeper perspective on this. Uh, and I think that is what the, the perspective of the Buddha really is about. Uh, I have a lot of respect for those people who do a lot of actions on climate change. I think it is really marvelous, you know. Uh, and I think sometimes people are putting their life on the line, uh, putting their future on the line uh, to do things that they really believe in. And I think that's worthy of a lot of respect. Uh, and I think that's kind of uh, awesome, to be honest with you. Uh, and uh, especially when they do it in a non-violent way, uh, because they, be precisely because they care. I think that's kind of marvelous. Uh, a lot of people, they sit at home in their armchairs and they read about dependent origination. Uh, and that's not really, not, not really sufficient. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it's better to read about dependent origination, by the way, than reading, uh, I don't know, what is Vogue or something like that. I don't know what people read. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Ajahn, thank you so much for your kindness and wisdom and inspiring talks. I have had the best time in here. Also, the guided meditations by Venerable Chanda and Venerable Pink have been super helpful. I have one last question. In Majjhima Nikaya 20, how to stop thinking, I read about squeeze, squash and torture mind with mind. I've come across this before but was never really uh, sure what to make of it. Uh, can you please explain that? So the uh, Majjhima 20, the stilling of thoughts, uh, has five uh, ways, right, of dealing with the thinking mind. Uh, and uh, the very last one is the squashing the mind with mind. Uh, so it is the last one you should use. When you're absolutely desperate, uh, when you're about to murder the meditator next to you, uh, <laughs> squash mind with mind, right? Because, you know, it's best not to murder good people. So, okay, hold back. Yeah. So it is a desperate thing when you have tried everything else, then you might do that. Uh, but it is not really recommended because uh, we know that if you suppress things too much, it can lead to all kinds of problems. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can lead to mental imbalances and all kinds of things. Uh, so uh, it is really just at the very end of trying everything else and that doesn't work, uh, then you may use that. Uh, so that is my reply to that one now. Uh, Even though I've been doing Anapanasati for years and I have a daily meditation program going for a long time, it seems my meditation is not progressing beyond the first step of the 16 steps of Anapanasati. Could you please advise how to progress beyond the first stage of knowing when it is a long breath or a short breath? Generally speaking, it is more difficult to go through some stage of Anapanasati more than others. If so, what would you identify as the most difficult stages to pass through? It would be much appreciated if I could express some thoughts on this. So, so uh, the, the reason why you are not progressing, and remember Anapanasati is a profound uh, meditation uh, technique, and it's not, a lot of people find it hard to really get to watching the breath. It is not easy. Uh, and uh, so the answer is that you have to purify those two things that are the foundation of meditation, which I mentioned at the beginning of the retreat, uh, virtue and right view. These are the two things. This is what stands in the way of being able to watch the breath. Uh, once you make those really powerful, uh, that is when you kind of, this will start to work. So make sure that you purify your mind, uh, you really focus on having compassion rather than having ill will, that you have see the good in the people around you, all of these kind of things, and also the right view, the idea of where happiness is to be found. It is to be found in meditation, not in the world. And your mind will turn away more from the world. That is one of those powerful things that enables meditation to take hold. So keep on reading suttas, listening to some good talks, not too many, but the right number. And uh, then, uh, gradually, the, this will become possible uh, as, as you do that. Uh, uh, is it any stage more difficult to go through than any other stage? The first stage is the most difficult one, uh, as you are rightly fi finding out yourself, right? It is the hardest one, because uh, creating the foundations is what takes the most time and is the most difficult thing to do. Uh, uh, once you get to the first stage, uh, then uh, things uh, tend to progress more smoothly. And you, 
tend to already enjoy the meditation if you're able to do the very first stage. Uh, so get to there. And then when you get to the first stage, you have to continue with doing the uh, living really well. Yeah, More compassion and kindness, all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, continue purifying your view. And as you do that, uh, the meditation will go through all of the stages. Uh, so you never stop with the doing the foundational practices, uh, that always goes on, uh, and then that will support the progression of the mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. So uh, learn to really relax, and yeah, this is so important. Uh, people tend to grasp the breath too much, and I think the, you will find that this is the case for the vast majority of people. Uh, relax, sit back, allow things to flow, allow mindfulness to arise naturally. Yeah. Don't make mindfulness a forced thing, make it a natural thing. Yeah. The breath is there. The breath is not something you watch. It's one of the things I was trying to say in this last meditation. The breath is more like a companion. Don't watch it. Just go along with the breath. The breath is there on the side a little bit. If you try watching it, that means often force right there. So change your perceptions of what you're doing. Sit back more. Allow things to be more natural. And then see what happens. Dear Ajahn Brahmali, thank you for, the, for leading this retreat. I have gained so much from it. Uh, like you, I too have a favorite suttas. Uh, out of turn is the Kuk Sutta. The Kuk Sutta is great, yeah? Uh, this is found in the Connected Discourses uh, uh, 47th chapter, which is the uh, Satipatthana Sangyutta, Sutta number 8, uh, uh, which uh, likens a monk who doesn't gain samadhi or abandon their kilesas uh, uh, through the Satipatthana practice to an incompetent cook who doesn't gain any uh, bonus from the uh, from the king because he doesn't take a notice of which flavor and curries the king prefers. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, the incompetent bhikkhu doesn't gain samadhi and abandons his kilesas because uh, you mentioned having, <laughs> that is what it says, honestly reading the note, that's what it says here. <laughs> you mentioned having Sati Sampajanya about progress or not uh, of our Satipatthana practice, and I wonder if that is what this uh, sutta is talking about. Uh, um, so, uh, Yes, I think taking notice of the... Uh, I can't remember exactly how the sutta goes now, but um, I mean precisely how it goes. Uh, but I would say that taking notice of the king's preferences is a bit like understanding your mind, probably, and seeing the defilements and knowing what the, leads the mind onward and actually helps you abandon the defilements. I would say that is similar. Tata... Uh, He's so big of a balo. So this is the fool, a biato, unintelligent, bhikkhu, yeah? the foolish, unintelligent, unskillful bhikkhu. Sakasa chitasa nimitta na uganata. He doesn't grasp the nimitta, the sign of his own mind. So, um, and uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. What does the chitasa nimitta mean in this kind of context? What is the sign of the mind? And uh, the sign here, nimitta, is a mark, it is an identifying characteristic, how you know that the mind is there. Sakasa means your own. So uh, it is um, uh, understanding the, uh, that the mind, understanding the mind, basically. Yeah? That's what it comes, comes down to. And especially the nimitta of the mind, the characteristic of the mind, may very well be similar to the nimitta that you experience in meditation, because that is how you know uh, that now you are leaving the physical world behind, the five senses behind, and you're moving towards the mind. So it could actually be a reference to that nimitta, because it is a similar kind of idea, understanding your mind. Yeah? So you're grasping the characteristic of the mind. Uh, so I would say, yes, understanding the characteristic of the mind is important. It could here also be used in a broader sense, uh, that you understand the characteristics in terms of the defilements and also the purities of mind, and you understand how they work and how you abandon all of these things. That is part of kind of the broader context. I should have liked to have the sutta next to me because then I could have actually looked it up and I could have taken a better look at the actual the details of the wording of that sutta. But I think basically you are on the right track here. 
So, uh, yeah, so it is probably a kind of uh, uh, Sati Sampajanya or Yoniso Manasikara or uh, just general awareness of what is happening in your mind. Maybe part of this is also the uh, reflection you do after the meditation, right? And to understand the process and all of these kind of things. So. All right. Dear Ajahn, very interesting to hear your idea on the Buddhist teaching not being just in the past, uh, but uh, a live ripple effect uh, that we are part of. Uh, it made me think of the, uh, the Big Bang, uh, an explosion of energy that is still expanding the universe and forms the light we see, we see by. It gives me faith and inspiration to think of the Buddha's awakening. Uh, or first teaching like an energetic Big Bang that is still happening now. Perhaps it is one big awakening uh, happening uh, through us, uh, as if we can trust in being the Buddha's, uh, in being the Buddha's awakening, uh, still rippling out uh, a force of nature beyond our understanding or will. Um, yes. Uh, being the Buddha's awakening, I would maybe say that we are conditioned by the Buddha's awakening rather than being it. And that conditioning effect is still felt in the same way that the Big Bang, the conditioning of the Big Bang is still felt yeah, through the light in the universe and all of that. As part of that <coughs> energy, could you share your understanding of the Bahya Sutta for those of us with a little uh, little star, little dust in our eyes. Okay, thank you so much for your earnest love of the teachings. Uh, uh, we feel it with you. Okay, good. Um, so uh, the understanding of the Bahya Sutta is a very kind of profound teaching. Yeah? And uh, this is where the Buddha says that in the seen, let there only be the seen. In the heard, let there only be the heard. In the, in the sense, let there only be the sense. In the thought, let there only be the thought, etc. And uh, so what does that actually mean? And what it means is that uh, we tend to proliferate, uh, right? We tend to, when we see something, we tend to have a relationship to the things that we sense and the sen things that we see in the world. Uh, and so, for example, our relationship with the things is, when I see these, I think, my glasses, yeah? Don't touch them. Yeah, they're mine, me, yeah? me and mine. Uh, and so there is a sense of ownership of these glasses. Uh, and uh, so this is kind of how we relate to almost everything that comes through our senses. Uh, yeah? There's this idea that we proliferate about it in a way that relates to the sense of self. Uh, and this expresses itself in various ways. One of the ways is craving. Uh, we crave for things, uh, right? We see things, we think, oh, I would like that, that would be cool. Uh, yeah? And that's craving. It expresses itself through conceit. Uh, yeah? The idea of I am, or I am better, or I am worse, or whatever. The conceit is also part of this delusion, and that proliferates. You see people and you compare yourself to others. Uh, yeah? Kind of a typical human thing to do. Uh. And then it expresses itself through views about the world, views that are often wrong, uh, eternalism, annihilationism, and these kind of things. Uh. So we relate to the world through the sense of self. And because of the sense of self, we proliferate and we kind of, we, we do, we, we make things out of the world that are not actually there. So when the Buddha says, in the scene, let it just be the scene, he says, eliminate the sense of self in regard to everything you experience. When the sense of self is gone, there will be no proliferation about those things. There will be no more conceit, no more craving, no more views. There will just be the experience. And that is like the experience of the Arahant. And that is why the Buddha says this to, uh, to Bahia. Yeah? And uh, how he could understand that, I don't know, it's very profound to understand all of that just from that simple teaching. But if, maybe he was already a stream mentor. Maybe he was already kind of uh, uh, some, I don't know, super duper meditator or something. Not sure, but he seems he got it. Now, these, that Bahya Sutta is uh, found in the Udana, it's one of the uh, Kudukanikaya collections, uh, and those suttas are probably a little bit less reliable than the four main Nikayas, uh, so not sure how reliable that story is, but it's a cool story anyway, so we kind of, we like to talk about it. Uh. So, uh, yeah, Bahya. I hope you're okay with that, uh, it's kind of a short version of a very complex topic, uh, but uh, gives you some idea of what is going on. Uh. Dear Ajahn, apart from Ajahn Brahm, are there any other teachers uh, who you find inspiring? Uh, the Buddha. 
Yeah. <laughs> one of those weird things that I always found in the Buddhist world is that when you ask someone who is your teacher, yeah, they say, oh, Bhante Gunaratana, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, Dalai Lama, Ajahn Brahm, uh, Venerable Chanda, uh, uh, <laughs> Aya so-and-so, uh, Rinpoche so-and-so, uh, whoever it is, right? There's always some master so-and-so. Uh, but nobody ever says the Buddha. And that's kind of the something really wrong about that. Uh, because the Buddha is still here. Yeah? He still have his teachings. Uh, so of course the Buddha should be our number one teacher. Huh? But I know, I know that wasn't the answer you were looking for, right? Uh, so <laughs> I'm just being, being naughty now. So the Buddha is number uh, one. But uh, there are quite a few teachers in the world who are really inspiring. You know, one of them is, who I find very inspiring is Ajahn Ganha. Ajahn Ganha is actually the nephew of Ajahn of uh, uh, Lumpur Cha, yeah, Ajahn Cha. He's his nephew, he's still alive in Thailand, uh, and he has this monastery in uh, close to a national park, uh, and he is one of these kind of people with endless energy, endless loving kindness, endless compassion, uh, and you sit there, you kind of bathe in his loving compassion. People just love to be with him, yeah, because they feel so relaxed in his presence, uh, so they just hang out with him, yeah. Even though what he says is very simple, yeah, it's it's okay, it's uh, it's fine, but it's not. It, after a while, you kind of heard what he has to say, and it's not maybe super interesting, but but it's more where he's coming from, right? And this is the thing about so many things in the world: it's not what people say, but how they say it that really matters. Uh, and he's one of these people. When he says it, it kind of goes to your heart, even though it is very simple. He says, "Be kind." You think, "Yeah, be kind." Right? <laughs> it's like, it really sinks in. Uh, and uh, an incredibly powerful loving kindness. And, uh, and he's very nice to people who are close to Ajahn Brahm, because he's close to Ajahn Brahm. Uh, and so when he, this is a secret, I tell this only for you here, don't pass it on. Uh, if you go there and you say you're Ajahn Brahm disciple, he will kind of take you aside and kind of give you special treatment. Uh, Maybe, maybe, I don't know. He did that to me anyway, but then I'm a monk, so it's a bit different. Uh, he kind of drove with me around for hours and hours and hours, and I was kind of asking him endless questions. Uh, and he was very patient uh, and just answering all the time. Uh, and um, so he is really, really, really in interesting monk, yeah, but he's also quite famous. And when you go there, you'll probably be with many other people. Uh, but uh, anyway, check him out if you have a chance. You have to go all the way to Thailand to, to do that. Uh, um, there are, well, who else is inspiring? Bhante Gunaratana is quite an inspiring monk, yeah, this really old Sri Lankan monk uh, lives in uh, Virginia, West Virginia, I think, uh, in the US, uh, not far from Washington DC, he has a vihara there called the Bhavana Society, uh, he's getting very old now, but still in good health, still teaching, uh, and he has, uh, he has a, also a good grasp of the dumb mind, he's into jhanas and all these kind of things, uh, so he's an inspiring monk. Uh, uh, the, uh, the abbot of Wat Pampong, who took after Ajahn Shah, uh, Lumpur Liam, yeah, he's also a very inspiring monk, and uh, so he's also very interested in going to listen to him, what he has to say. Uh, so there are quite a few alive in the present day who actually are really uh, inspiring. There are many who have passed away who are also uh, really inspiring, but I guess you want some living teachers, is that what you said? Uh, actually, you didn't say living here, yeah. you just said teach, you find inspiring, okay. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so those are some of the living uh, people who are, to my mind, very inspiring. There are some very inspiring nuns around as well, uh, who I kind of uh, find really, uh, really nice. Uh, just, to me, just the Abbot of Damasara Monastery, Ajahn uh, Hasapanya, is actually a very inspiring person. Uh, she's very kind of, she's a good meditator, uh, she is... Um, uh, she runs that monastery. She is from Malaysia originally. Her, her English isn't that good. Uh, has, she has this amazing confidence. She just gets up on the stage and gives Dhamma talks to vast numbers of people. No problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and that's kind of quite cool, right, to do that when your English is not that great and you kind of, you, you are a nun among all the monks and you just get up on the stage and you're kind of completely confident and at ease. We give it talks to large numbers of people. And she goes back and meditates deeply. And she is uh, she's quite in inspiring in many ways, actually. So I really like uh, Ajahn Hasapanya. Um, and uh, so, but in many ways, it's the best to kind of go out there for yourself and uh, try out, check out various monasteries uh, and uh, try to have a look at these monastics uh, and then find out for yourself who you find inspiring. Uh, 
but uh, uh, watch, uh, watch carefully, watch over time, and then you find out. Uh, who are the dodgy monks to avoid? <laughs> okay, well, this is getting dangerous territory here. The dodgy monks to avoid are the ones who are badly conducted, uh, who don't practice uh, properly, uh, who don't keep their precepts in the right way. Yeah, this is the first thing. Stay with those who are really practicing in the right way. Sometimes you can find good monastics who are not super duper careful with the precepts. Sometimes that happens uh, because they have maybe grown up with other monastics who were a bit dodgy and they have kind of kept some of those dodgy habits. Uh, but generally speaking, a good monastic is someone who keeps good, keeps the rules well, generally speaking. Yeah. The other thing you should look out for is the views of the person. Yeah? Do they have views that align with the suttas? Uh, and one of the kind of most dangerous things that are happening in Buddhism is the prevalence of eternalist views. Uh, people who think that Buddhism is no different from Advaita Vedanta, the kind of Hindu teachings. Uh, and basically saying they are the same. Yeah, yeah, eternal mind, okay, you carry on forever after, and that's kind of Buddhism. It's not Buddhism. And this is kind of a really big distortion uh, happening to the sutras as far as I'm concerned. Uh, that, to me, is kind of a red flag. And some of these monks who have these views are actually incredibly famous. Uh, and I think that is very dangerous. Uh, the Buddha warns against this. He warns against the people who are really famous uh, but have wrong views. It's actually a specific warning in the suttas, in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, because people tend to be drawn, because people don't usually have the ability to discern for themselves. Uh, so they are drawn by the fact that other people uh, like these monks, uh, yeah, instead of actually thinking properly, uh, is this right view? Uh? So, uh, this is a big problem in the world. So, look for those two things, yeah. Other practice probably have they got right view, uh, and then watch them if they have the qualities of someone worthy of inspiration, uh, right? Uh, do they act with kindness and these kind of things? Uh? This is good news. I think I will be able to finish. Yeah, so this is uh, exactly what I had planned. So that's good. Huh? So now, which one is best to finish on? Uh, oh, that's a nice one. I finish on. No, is that a nice one? Huh? Uh, okay, no. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, I have to finish on a good note, right? Uh, actually, there's more tomorrow anyway, so it doesn't matter so much. Anyway, let's just fire away. So, dear Ajahn, how do I know if there are devas protecting me? Uh, how do they appear to one? Also. Are there good and bad devas, just like humans? Thank you. There are good and bad devas, right? So make sure you get a good one to protect you, otherwise you may be in trouble. And I'm just messing around with you. Don't, please don't take that too seriously. I, the, um, there are good and bad devas, in a sense. And uh, because they are a bit like humans, sometimes they do bad things. And there are examples of that in the suttas, actually. Yeah? Yeah? Devas doing dodgy stuff. Uh, and, but if someone protects you, there will be a good deva. Bad devas don't protect you, they do the opposite. They disprotect you. They put you in danger, that's what they do. I'm not sure if disprotect is a word. But. So, uh, uh, how do you know? You, uh, it, it's hard to know, yeah? It is hard to know unless something really weird happens in your life. Uh, yeah? so, suddenly, it looks like someone is taking over because you are in danger or something like that, uh, yeah? then you may have an idea that someone is protecting you. But it normally takes a very high level of virtue uh, to be protected. Uh, yeah? You have to be super duper pure before the devas bother, bother with you. Uh, and then, you are, uh, then they kind of come down and they look after you. Uh. So, um, how do they appear to one? Again, they appear by t some, somehow maybe taking over something, or sometimes they appear as uh, lights in your mind, uh, etc. Uh. Yeah. All right. Dear Ajahn, when we see a light during Anapanasati meditation, then should we change our attention from breath to the light? Uh, please kindly explain. Um, yes, uh, the breath will still be there often, a little bit in the background, depending on the power of that light. Uh, the more powerful the light is, the more it kind of uh, blots out the breath. Uh, but if the light is not so strong, the breath may still be there a little bit in the background. Yeah? It's not completely gone yet. Uh, so in a sense, you can still go with both, but the light should be the main focus. Uh, yeah? We actually don't really want to use the word focus. It sounds like too much willpower. The light is the main object that you are aware of. Uh, 
So, uh, but to be able to do that, the light has to be quite stable. Uh, it has to be fairly, fairly strong. Uh, so make it stable first through the breath meditation. Uh, and when the stability is achieved, then uh, the, the shift in focus will almost happen automatically. Yeah? You will be drawn towards it and it will kind of happen fairly naturally. Uh, you don't have to try very hard for these things to, to happen. Uh, but yes, your, your attention and eventually when the, uh, the nimitta is stable, then goes from the breath to the nimitta and you allow the breath to disappear as much as possible. Uh, Okay, we have come to the last question here. So, uh, here we are. Dear Arjan, do Arahants have any supernormal abilities to rescue sentient beings who are suffering or in peril? Thank you for your wisdom, Meta. Do Arahants ever have to rescue sentient beings uh, who are suffering or in peril? Um, they, the most important supernormal ability of the Arahant is they can teach the Dhamma. That is pretty supernormal. Uh, what is interesting in the uh, Suttas uh, is the Buddha talks about various kinds of miracles, Pati Harya, and uh, or they can be called maybe marvels or wonders rather than miracles. They're not really miracles in the Christian sense of the word, uh, uh, but they are marvelous things. Uh, and then, first of all, this is from the Kevada Sutta, if you want to look it up. This is in the Long Discourse, the Buddha number 11. And in this Kevada Sutta, uh, the Buddha is traveling to this town, I think maybe it's Nalanda or something like that, I can't remember now where exactly it is. Uh, and then this householder, Kevada, comes to the Buddha and he says to the Buddha, please show off all these supernormal powers. We want to see the monks flying through the sky. We want to see monks sinking into the earth. We want to see all these marvelous things because it will give rise to greater faith in the lay people. That's the argument, yeah? And uh, that is an interesting argument. Maybe is that right? Will it give rise to more faith? I don't think so. I think what will happen is it will be like a bit of entertainment and afterwards you start wondering, was it that really, did that really happen? Or, or, you know, was it really important? And actually, sometimes actually can be really dodgy, this kind of thing. Maybe for some people it gives rise to greater faith, but it really depends on the person. And so I, uh, I'm kind of skeptical. Now, while I am on this topic, uh, before I move on with this one, uh, there is in the uh, Mahabangsa, Mahabangsa is the, the chronicle of Sri Lanka, yes, Sri Lankan history, in the ancient Sri Lankan history here. Uh, According to this chronicle of the Mahavangsa, there was a time in Sri Lanka that there were so many arahants flying through the sky that the crops did not ripen. Because <laughs> <laughs> the sky was so dark, right? There was no sunlight coming through. There were so many arahants everywhere flying in the sky. The crops could not ripen. Now, I think that story is a little bit dodgy here. So... <laughs> And especially since the Buddha didn't really recommend arahants to fly through the sky, so uh, that is... Uh, so, so, so then, coming back to the Kevada Sutta that I'm actually talking about, uh, and the Buddha replies to Kevada. Uh, Kevada is asking the Buddha to ask his monks to do all kinds of supernormal powers. Uh, and the Buddha says to Kevada, he says, I abhor, I detest, uh, I'm, uh, these supernormal powers are terrible, he says to Kevada, right? Uh, and what he says is that he says that you know, but those people who already have faith, uh, well, they may increase their faith uh, if, uh, uh, you know, uh, if the monks show this kind of supernormal powers, maybe the nuns as well or whoever. Uh, but those people who are skeptical about it, they will just dismiss it as some kind of magical trick. Uh, yeah, and of course that is exactly what happens, isn't it? Uh, and if you look today, you look at some of those magical tricks online, uh, they look exactly like the things they did with supernormal powers at the time of the talk about in the suttas, uh, right? I don't know if you've seen some of these magicians. Have you seen the one who walks on water? Uh, that's actually in, you go to YouTube, uh, you look at a magi magician called Dynamo walking on water, uh, and he, he, he literally walks on the River Thames, uh, right? It's close to Waterloo Bridge. The Waterloo Bridge is there. It's obviously all set up, right? It's kind of, and then he goes down to the, to the, all the way down to the shore, uh, and it's like a little kind of jetty there or something, uh, and then he steps onto the water and hold, holds out his arms like this. Uh, he looks a bit like Jesus Christ when he does this, right? Uh, and he walks slowly onto the water. Uh, and then you, the camera kind of pans water to a bridge. And you see all these people stopping on the water to a bridge, staring down at this man walking onto the water. It's actually really cool. Uh, 
but it's obviously just a trick, right? And the way he does it is actually well known. He has some kind of plexiglass something lying on the water, and so he's just actually walking on something solid. That's what he's doing. It's actually very boring once you know what it is. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, so this is kind of how people dismiss uh, supernormal powers, yeah? and usually for very good reasons, because usually this is exactly what happens. Uh, so the Buddha is actually very much against supernormal powers. Uh, and he says to his monks that you are not allowed to show any supernormal power. This is one of the rules for the monastics. So if you happen to have it, you should never show it. So supernormal powers are usually overstated. They're far less interesting than they are made out to be. Um, so that is why the Buddha says the real supernormal power, the real marvel, is the marvel of teaching. That is the one that matters. All the other stuff is actually quite irrelevant. Uh, and this is the marvel, the fact that it's possible to pass on something so profound as the Dhamma from one person to the next one. Uh, and the other person is able to understand it, practice accordingly, and get the same kind of results. That is the real marvel. And that is the marvel that rescues you from suffering at the end of the day. Uh, I know this is not what you're asking, uh, but this is what I'm giving you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Because this is what matters, uh, yeah? Can arahants rescue you from suffering in other ways? Maybe they can, but it's kind of irrelevant. What kind of suffering is that? You know, you're broken a leg and you're lying somewhere and the arahant flies through the air and picks you up. Is that, is that what you mean? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, the idea of the whole path of Dhamma is to end all the suffering once and for all. It's a big picture ending of suffering. Uh, Arahants are not so concerned if you have a tummy ache, yeah, right? Uh, they will say, okay, go tummy ache, that's a good lesson for you, learn about illness, and this is your chance. Uh, everyone has tummy aches, it's to be expected. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, this kind of aiding by an arahant is not really what uh, arahants are about. Uh, they are about big picture aiding, big picture helping out. Uh, that is what matters. Okay. Everyone, so that is uh, all for tonight. Uh, tomorrow morning the meditation is at 6.30 uh, and we'll see you back again and continue the last Dhamma discussion at 9 o'clock. Uh, in the meantime, have one last good night's rest uh, and uh, let's just do the homage to the Buddha Dhamma Sangha to finish off. Arahang Sama Sambudo Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhivademi Svaka to Bhagavata Dhammo Tamang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sanghang Namah